Hi, I'm Daniel Grove, and I've got seven awesome tips for portrait photography. Now, first of all, let me start off by saying two things. First of all, I love portrait photography. To me, portrait photography is special because I'm an extrovert. I love meeting people. I love hearing their stories and learning about them um, and seeing how people are different than myself. That has always intrigued and interested me. And for me, portrait photography is just that, combined with art and, of course, photography, which I love. Uh, so I enjoy getting to know people and turning that into a photograph so that other people that view that photo can get to learn a bit about that person, too. So for me, that's what portrait photography is. Now, portrait photography does kind of contain a lot of different things. And this is the second thing I wanted to say is that portrait photography is kind of vague. It could include family portraits, high school seniors, uh, professional headshots, models, cosplayers, all kinds of things are kind of grouped inside portrait photography. But in my book, as long as there's a person as a subject of your photo, it's a portrait. So with that said, let's get started with the first tip. And I'm not going to make you wait till the end of the video for the best tip. No, no, no. I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to flip the script. Number one, the best tip I have. You ready for this? Sit down. Make sure you're, you're seated for this bug spray. Now, I live in Texas, right? In the south down here, we got mosquitoes. We got flies and gnats and all kinds of gross things that just really make a photo shoot unpleasant, especially during the summertime and uh, bug spray. I'm just going to leave it at that. You are welcome. I just saved you so many photo shoots and you can impress your clients by bringing your own for them. There you go. Okay, tip number two. This will be a little bit more globally, uh, you know, applicable, I think, is this. Get to know your clients. It's pretty obvious, right? But it's really important and you don't want to skip over this. You want to do as much as you can to get to know your clients because that's going to make the photos better. When you understand them more, when they understand you, and you connect with them better, your photos are going to be better because you'll be able to pose them and guide them. They'll be able to relax and have more fun in front of the camera. And like I said, that equals better pictures. So there's a few questions you want to ask your client before the photo shoot happens. You know, when you're in that planning stage, a month, a week, hopefully more than a few days before the photo shoot, here's three good questions you got to ask them. Number one, have you ever had a professional photo shoot and what was that experience like? That's pretty good. Not to just sit back and wait for their response. You know, they may say, oh, we've never been photographed ever, ever before. That's that's not bad. That's good because then you're the first, right? You get to make the best first impression and they'll always weigh everybody else after you against how you perform. No pressure. That's just how it is. Now, if they have been photographed professionally before, maybe they had a really bad experience and hopefully they'll actually tell you because you've asked, what was that like for them? What was the bad part? Was it the photographer? Were they cold and boring and awkward? Was it the photos? Were they blurry or dark or not the style they wanted? Was the photographer slow? Did they give just a few digitals or too many? You know, all these things you need to know so that you can outperform the last guy. And it's kind of competitive. I'm not normally like that, but it's true. You want to outdo anything before. You want to outdo yourself. The second question you want to ask them is, what is most important to you about these photos? And again, just sit back and let them answer. Don't give them any ideas. Don't give them any hints. If they have no answer, they have no answer. But if you give them some time and you make them comfortable, they'll be honest and they'll tell you. Maybe what they value most is the fact that their mother in the family photo shoot has stage four cancer and she doesn't have long to go. You, they may not have told you that unless you asked for it. And that's pretty important to know. Other things that they may tell you is that they value candid. They just want mostly photos of their kids playing and being themselves because in two years time, they're not going to look the same. Kids grow fast. I got four, five, a fifth one on the way. So I know Little children are time travel machines. It's important you capture them good. That's another topic. But you want to know what they value most so that you can deliver that and make sure they're getting the most bang out of their buck. Third question, and this might be most important, although I'm a little biased on this one, but here's the question. What do you plan on doing with these photos? And just sit back and wait. They might say, oh, these photos are you know, just for Facebook. We just want to post it, let our family or our friends see our anniversary, or I just want a modeling portfolio. And that's fine. That's a pretty common answer. But you might get a little bit more interesting answer, which is this. Well, we have a big empty wall in our house. So we want to put some beautiful photos on it and you know, put something on that wall. We want some family art in our house. Cha-ching. That is a great answer. Those are my kind of clients. And that's where IPS or in-person sales comes in. It's an awesome business model where your main product you offer and why they hire you is for photos on the wall, albums on the coffee table, 
all that physical art that's actually going to last when the lights are turned off and in 50 years they'll still have it. Uh, but again, another topic for another video, another time. Um, but when you know that information, that's going to change your whole photo shoot aspect. You're going to be able to sell them high quality art that they couldn't have otherwise because they didn't have you. Um, so ask, what are they going to do with those photos? That'll help you prepare for the future. All right, tip number three, use a meaningful location. Don't just pick, you know, the popular park in town because it's pretty. Don't just pick the cool alleyway because it's cool. Ask your client, what style do they want for these photos? What are they going to wear? What kind of vibe do they have? And this is where getting to know them actually comes in because you get to know, oh, they're edgy, or they're quiet, or they're loud, or they like to ride mountain bikes, or they like to sit inside and play video games. All these different things about them really help you craft a photo shoot around who they really are, not who you want them to be or what all the other photo shoots on your portfolio look like. You know, make it unique to the person um, because they'll appreciate that and the photos will be awesome because they're going to have fun. So back to that question, ask them for a location that means something to them. Now, again, I, I am kind of narrowing in on family portraits. You may have kind of picked up on that. Uh, that's just because I'm coming fresh out of a really successful and fun photo shoot that this tip really influenced the photo shoot. So uh, that's why I'm going this route. But again, this applies to seniors, professionals, uh, models, you know, staff photos, anything like that. But ask them for a location that means something to them. Uh, was there a place where they had their first date, if it's a couple? Is there a park that their kids went to all the time? If they're a family, is there a location that matches that, you know, a vibe or even the theme of a favorite movie that they may have for models and seniors? That's a really big one. And it'll give you a big insight into what they want the end photos to look like. And you can take that to the next level and blow their socks off with an awesome location. Now, you may be saying, well, Daniel, I don't have any locations. I don't know the cool locations in town. Well, that is where you need to get out there and put in some miles. Location scouting is fun, it's awesome, and it's important to do as a location-based photographer like myself. I don't do studio, I can't, I don't like it, I don't want to. I like to be outside in a real location that matches my client's style and vibe. Um, now, to do that, I have had to drive around town um, and find spots. I've gone to all my parks and all the cool places I can think that might even possibly be able to do a photo shoot there, and I've logged it. I take wide angle pictures with my camera or my phone if that's all I got. I have a folder called locations. I'll name the images where they went from. I even have a spreadsheet. Yes, a spreadsheet. I know I'm a nerd and I embrace it. I have a spreadsheet of my locations with the address, the permit, if there is a permit, how much it costs, the phone number, the hours, the name, da, 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 da. all the stuff I may need to know when someone says, hey, uh, tomorrow like or to this evening, I got a senior that I need a photographer, other photographer bail then we need a location that's a, a grungy alleyway with graffiti. And I'm like, click, click, click. Oh yeah, I got these three options. Which one do you want to do? That's awesome right there. Instead of scrambling and then picking another popular location that everyone's done photos at, don't be that photographer. Don't be the copy and paste portrait photographer because there's so many of those in every city. Um, be the unique one that picks a location specifically for the client. All right, tip number four. This has to do with posing and prompts. So imagine this, you're going through your finished photo shoot one picture at a time, you know, like a slideshow, next, next, next. Don't let this happen. Don't let every single photo be your family or your subject standing up, facing the camera, smiling. And then the next picture is them standing up, smiling in a different location. And then, oh, this one's the kids standing up and smiling in front of this big rock. Don't do that. Change it up. <laughs> For the love of all things, add some variety into those poses. For example, First of all, don't have them face the, the camera for most of the pictures. Try to avoid that in general. You've got a 45 degree angle. You've got all the way sideways. Now you can have them look off sideways. You can have them smile or not smile. You can have them look over the camera, just past you, around their head. You've got your 45 with the same head positions, smiling and not smiling. Looking down at the ground is fun. If it's a girl in a dress, make her do a spin. If it's a guy, have him you know, fix his hair or fix his jacket. There's a lot of things you can do to spice up your poses. Um, now, prompts is an awesome new world that I've jumped into a few years ago with posing. And it, it, it's basically summed up in this word, promptography. And there's actually a Facebook group called Promptography that's all about this concept, which is you give your client a prompt, like not a question, but more of a instruction, and they follow it. Whatever happens as they follow this instruction will bring about some fun reactions or emotions and great natural candid poses. Now a prompt may be something as simple as, I want you to do a few spins. Pretend like you're, if it's a little kid, pretend like you're a fairy or pretend you're a superhero. Jump off that rock and save the day. You know, that's a prompt. And what happens after that? 
could be some amazing, amazing photos. A prompt for a wedding couple may be, I want you, the bride, to lean into the groom, whisper privately, I don't want to hear it, but I want you to whisper into his ears what you had for breakfast this morning in the sexiest, most sultriest voice possible, and you just stand back and start clicking. Make sure you're on burst mode, because something's going to happen. Now, even if they don't laugh out loud or you know have an amazing stock photo moment at when you tell your joke or your prompt, the real stuff might happen right after that when they kind of come down from the awkwardness and they you know loosen up and they start like, oh, that was silly or that was dumb or that was funny, you know. The, the reaction after what you told them to do is actually sometimes the great, the great moments so that you want to be able to capture quickly and accurately. Now, in a perfect world, I would love for my photo shoots to be about 25% poses and 75% candids and prompts because that's a good balance. I feel like you you want you want poses because they're traditional and they're standard. That's usually what they want on the wall. But there's also those candid moments like the kids tickling dad, you know, or attacking dad or the wife, you know, dancing with the husband and in between photos, right? In between. Sometimes you just got to pretend like you're not ready and just actually be ready. Or I, I, I tricked a client recently. I said, can you fix that hair behind your ear? And I was actually taking pictures while she just did this. And it was so nice. <laughs> and afterwards I said, hey, sorry, but uh, I tricked you, but I got some great photos. You want to see? And of course she loved them because they were real. It was a, a real, I call it a, a fake candid or a, a semi-candid moment. Um, those, those are great moments right there. So think of clever ways to get a reaction out of your client. All right, tip number five, get individual or solo portraits of the people in your photo shoot group. Now, again, this kind of applies to families. I did this at this recent photo shoot that I referred to re uh, earlier is I had a, a mom and dad and there was two um, young adult daughters. I think one was like 18, one was like 20 something. And I made sure to get some great, great individual portraits of each and every person, not just the pretty girls, but the mom and the dad. Guys need photos too, man. If you do wedding photography, please just take at least three, four or five minutes to get a, a, a few good shots of the groom because we know it's all about the bride. But you know what? Those guys are looking pretty good too. They had to put up with a lot of stuff. Maybe they paid for it. Maybe they helped. Uh, but give them some good portraits too. Give them some attention and some love. Um, but I feel like this is really important. And this is kind of a, kind of a downer right here. I don't want to depress you or you know give you anxiety. But we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Life is crazy. I have two or three of my high school friends that I grew up knowing that are dead now because of car wrecks, freak accidents, just weird stuff, health problems. And just the stuff happens, you know, life is, life is wild. Um, so having those individual portraits, you never know, you know, those, the, that solo portrait you took last summer of the person that might be, you know, the one photo they had of the kid for the funeral or the newspaper or whatever. But aside from that dark view of that whole topic, the light side is that when you take solo pictures of people at a, at a group, uh, when it's not normally f just for them, they realize that they're important. Uh, you know, the kids at the family photo shoot will say, Hey, like I was worth you know, five to 10 minutes of some good pictures. And I got some awesome pictures. I've never had a good picture of myself. I've heard that so many times. And it makes me so happy when I'm the guy to fix that problem. Um, I love giving people pictures that they've never even seen before. So be sure to sit down, take some time, bring a stool, get a long focal length lens, like an 85 or 100, and get some great, great compressed, just headshots and solo pictures of the people in your group. If that applies to your photo shoot, um, I promise you it'll be worth it in the end. Another cool thing that happens when you do this is that the other people that are not, you know, in front of the camera, they get a break. <laughs> and when your person's done, they get to go have a break and they get to kind of watch from an outside view what it looks like. And they also get to see you looking so professional and knowing exactly what you're doing. Um, and, you know, that's nice, too. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, give them a break and oh, make sure if it's a family or, you know, staff photos or a bunch of headshots, make sure that people are not behind you, because if I'm staring at my client, what are they looking at? Probably not me. They're looking at all their brothers and sisters laughing at them or their coworkers, you know, look, you know, try not to look, but looking. Get the extra people perpendicular. Get them over there or over there or hiding behind a wall just so that it's just you and the subject because that'll help them focus and that will lead to better fixtures in the end. All right, tip number six. Learn off-camera flash and have it ready just in case. Now, I like to use off-camera flash in most of my photo shoots, usually in a sneaky way. I'll just kind of add a little fill light. Like this recent family session that I did, I'll put some pictures in the video. Um, it was a beautiful golden hour, perfect. And the location, which was like the family's favorite park they always go to, right? Important location was that tip number 
three and uh, it worked, it paid off and beautiful lighting. But I still had off-camera flash going, even though this was a natural light styled photo shoot, golden hour, the sun was setting behind him. It was just ugh, fabulous. But I had my 34 inch softbox adding a little bit of fill light to their front and it made it look so nice and clean. Um, so I also have had shoots where I needed this more for the safety reason and not for the creative reason, whereas they came super late and the sun is going bye-bye and we don't have that, that beautiful golden hour lighting. Now it's like blue hour nighttime lighting. What are you gonna do if you don't have flash? You can't use a pop-up flash in your camera and get good pictures. Don't even try that. Get a speed light, get a light stand, get a controller on your camera. You can get a setup for with wireless speed light for about 200, maybe 250. Um, and that will take you a, a long way. And that, that'll open up more doors of possibilities of things you can do now that you could not do before. So just in case something crazy happens, you know, getting late, maybe there's a terrible traffic jam or there's an emergency and your photo shoot in the evening is late or whatever, um, you got a light to fill and you can still do photos. If you want to, you can still do them. Um, what if the shoot's inside a house? Are you gonna rely on yellow tungsten light bulbs to light up your subject? No, no, you're not. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, window light is awesome, but you don't always have window light. You can't have a whole family packed around a little window. Um, having a speed light wirelessly bouncing off the ceiling or the back wall coming towards them, that's awesome. You can get some beautiful inside photos with just a $60 speed light. I know because I've done it. Um, and if you want to see what I suggest buying, I'm actually going to put some uh, affiliate links down in the description down below so you can see some very affordable and a little bit higher end lighting setups that I suggest buying if you're curious about that. So have off camera flash ready, actually learn how to use it so you can have that as a backup plan or a creative option or in, the, in between to be able to fill in those shadows and just make more pleasing portraits. All right, my last tip, number seven, uh, and this is kind of alluded to earlier, but shoot during golden hour. If you have a photo shoot on October 25th, Google sunset time, October 25th, 2000, whatever the year is, uh, <laughs> and you'll see the exact time. Oh, by the way, type in your city too, because that matters. You'll see the exact time the sun goes down over the horizon. Back up about five minutes, that's when you want your photo shoot to really be in its prime or ending because that's when the sun will get the beautiful sunsets. So trying to time your photo shoots um, during that last hour leading up to and ending at sunset time. If you want to go past that, you'll need some off-camera flash, which by the way, I love shooting past sunlight. That's when the, the creative edgy stuff comes out if we're going for that. Um, but that, that 30 minutes just before sunset is beautiful. Um, why I like this so much is that the sun is lower on the horizon, right? It's not above you like noontime. It's down here, just about to go, or we're about to rotate away from it. Actually, it's not moving. We are. Um, so when the sun is lower, when we are turned away from it, uh, the light coming from the sun is actually diffused because it's going through what? Atmosphere. And it's going through more atmosphere because it's lower. And it's bouncing off of the clouds and coming down at a different angle. So you actually have soft sun lighting or softer sun lighting in the evening than you do in noontime. Which there is nothing, unless it's cloudy, there's nothing to diffuse direct sunlight in the middle of the day. I, for years, oh, it's so embarrassing. For years, probably five years, I shot middle of the day, 3 p.m., 12 p.m., you know, 4 p.m. I didn't know any better because no one told me. I didn't have my YouTube channel to tell me this seventh tip of great seven tips for portrait photography. I didn't have Facebook groups or YouTube or anything to help me um, not be an idiot. And no offense if you don't shoot during golden hour, I'm not calling you an idiot. I, I was, I had a lot of problems that took me way too long to get to get rid of. Um, and one of them was shooting at the right time of day for the look that I personally wanted. I wanted soft light. I wanted golden hour. I just didn't know what it was called or when it was. Um, once I learned, oh, <laughs> all those years, I was shooting in the middle of a hot, sweaty day. What was I doing? No wonder the photos never looked how I wanted them. Um, so look up the sunset time, start one hour before that sunset time and have fun with the beautiful evening lighting. You also have the option of where the light is coming from because when it's low, you can have the sun hit your subject from the side. 90 degrees, hit them behind, get that halo backlighting or the other side or have them look in you know, towards the sun and get golden hour or you know light on their face. You've got at least four options there. If the sun's above you, no matter where you turn, it's the same. You get ugly shadows coming down from the nose, from the eye, eyebrows, the chin, it's just not pleasing. Now, if it's a cloudy day, totally different story. You can shoot all day long if it's, if it's overcast and I love overcast days. But uh, yeah, be aware of where your sun is coming from and how diffused it is as it gets more diffused in the evening. Um, so I hope these tips were great for you guys. I hope there's some new photographers that all these seven tips are just blowing your mind. 
There's probably some professionals out there that are like, oh yeah, I know all that. Uh, but who knows, maybe you learned something along the way. I hope you did. If you did, comment down below. If you have any questions or concerns or anything like that, comment down below and I will get back to you very soon. Thank you so much for watching this and have a great week shooting.